Well, then uh, welcome everybody back to Marcus Lund's third out of four talks uh, in this lecture series. And again, let me highlight that we will have four talks. It was decided that there's also going to be a talk tomorrow in contrast to what was initially announced. So make sure you don't miss the talk tomorrow or at least watch it on YouTube. Also, um, both first talks of Jonathan are mean in, in the meanwhile online. So, okay, then I pass over to Marcos for his third talk. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. So, yeah, let me, let me try to uh, start uh, where we finished off last time. So, so let's recall that the goal currently in this uh, series of lectures is to make qualitative statements about the comparison map. Um, if we have a a comma, so we fix an R as always, and we have this module with involution over R. And uh, associated to this fixed comma, we can look at a purely quadratic variant and a purely symmetric variant, which was just given by taking homotopy orbits on some mapping space and homotopy fixed points of some mapping space or spectrum. And what we would like to understand is, given particular information about this concrete structure comma, what can we say about comparison map from, quadrat from the quadratic version and to the symmetric version. So currently this might sound like a, a say artificial thing. Why, why would you focus on these, on these two extreme versions of this quadratic structure and the symmetric structure? But they have very, very nice uh, behavior, um, which is sort of not always present for, the, for a copper that might sit in between like the genuine symmetric ones or the genuine quadratic ones that we've seen. And so we're going to see some of the features that these um, that this copper Q and copper S has. And uh, so once we can show something about, uh, uh, yeah, this, these maps inducing certain, well, isomorphisms on homotopy groups in a certain range, we will typically be able to calculate many, many homotopy groups of this. Right? Recall that currently what we've done is we've calculated the zeroth L group of such a, um, a DPR with a, a Poincaré structure copper, which we assumed uh, to send projective modules sitting in degree zero, finitely generated projective sitting in degree zero to einberg MacLane spectra in degree zero. So in the, in the notation of Jonathan's talk, those are precisely those Poincaré structures on, um, on the derived perfect category of R, which are uh, non-abelian derived functors associated to a classical quadratic functor uh, in the sense of Einberg and MacLane on just projective modules taking values in abelian groups. So the examples here are, are these genuine symmetric and genuine quadratic versions that just take a projective module to the abelian group of symmetric or quadratic points. No homotopy fixed point or homotopy orbits, which introduces more uh, higher homotopy groups on such terms. And okay, so the theorem I indicated last time, and I just want to recall a bit, is that if we have a Poincaré structure of COPA, which is n quadratic, and recall that being m quadratic means that uh, the linear term, so that was one of the exercises you can characterize as saying that the linear term satisfies a certain connectivity estimate. Um, so one way of writing it is that just this uh, module n that we had, which classifies the linear part itself is m connected. So under this assumption, then the statement is that the comparison map from the quadratic uh, uh, Poincaré structure to your given Poincaré structure copper induces an isomorphism on L groups in a range determined by this, uh, by this number M, by the quadraticity of M, so to say. And in other words, in infinitely many cases in, in low degrees, so typically the negative homotopy groups of this L-theory spectrum will be just the, the, you know, the, the quadratic L groups associated with this purely, purely quadratic uh, Poincaré structure associated to M. And, uh, right, so let me recall the proof idea because uh, Thomas and I got a bit confused last time, so let me briefly go through it again. So the, the very first idea is to show that elements on both sides uh, you can represent um, in terms of Poincaré objects x, q, which satisfy a certain connectivity bound, such that k is minus k connected, so roughly minus half the degree uh, n connected if we write n equals to 2k or 2k minus 1 or something. And so this is just the, the, the argument we've seen last time. Uh, if, if you have any complex which does not yet satisfy this bound, then for purely formal reasons, using this 
the fact that copper is m quadratic, you will be able to perform surgeries to get rid of lower homotopies, and then you will just push your complex to be minus k connected. So there's just no obstruction for doing this. Then, so this is sort of on the way of proving surjectivity of this map, as I said. So, so once we have this, the second step that we want to know is that once we've made our uh, representatives be uh, satisfied this connectivity estimate, then we want to know that uh, the, the space of copper forms, um, say this one here, the space of copper forms on uh, X, uh, you can lift any to a, to a copper Q form on X. So in other words, that once we, you know, you have, yes, I mean, if the, the, the Q that we, X and Q that we wish to lift in, in along this map will be having Q a, a point in this space by the fact that we've already, you know, we've already computed that the nth L group of C copper is given by the zeroth L group of C comma loops N copper. So it's really a point in the space that we need to lift in order to prove the subjectivity of this map. And then the statement is just, well, again, you use the quadraticity assumption to show that this map is pi not subjective. You just calculate the co-fiber of this map, and it turns out to be connected. And it's really exactly subjective. It's nothing more. So this is what I try to highlight here. Uh, if you combine these two statements, then you will find that the map that we try to investigate is, um, is subjective. And now if you want to prove injectivity, then you do a similar argument for just the Lagrangian. You have to lift Lagrangians. And then the statement is that you will also find that you can make it uh, by, by performing surgeries. You will be able to make the Lagrangian satisfy a certain connectivity estimate. And then you will have a very similar statement that for such uh, highly connected or such correctly connected Lagrangians, the statement will be that you can lift the null homotopy. Okay? instead of lifting the form. But okay, there is a similar statement that you can make. And this is, again, only a statement about how uh, the, this uh, map from QQ or copper Q to copper evaluates on a particular uh, module with a particular connectivity estimate. So it's, it's a very formal thing that happens. But the idea is just we can lift, uh, for highly connected objects, we can lift the form. And for highly connected Lagrangians, we can lift the null homotopy witnessing it being a Lagrangian. And then, well, yeah. Okay, so this is, this is roughly the, the way you, you prove this result. It's all the methods that we've seen in, in, in the last talk. It's really only performing surgery and then calculating the particular elements. And so, in particular, we always keep in mind that if we have a Poincaré structure which satisfies this m quadraticity, then in the low range, the L groups are just quadratic L groups. It's nothing, nothing else. Good. So uh, let me make that explicit. As a corollary, we find that the L group of the of the quadratic Poincaré structure and uh, I, I'm sorry that the L groups of the genuine quadratic Poincaré structure. Uh, are given by the, these homotopy theoretic or homotopy theoretical quadratic uh, Poincaré structure L groups uh, for n less or equals to one, and in the symmetric case you find it for n less or equals to minus three. So in other words, if we look at this genuine symmetric L theory, although the the input is given by studying symmetric forms over a ring, nevertheless it turns out that the negative homotopy groups of this L spectrum are just purely quadratic. L. Those are, those are not of symmetric flavor. This is actually something that Andrew Ranitsky had an, anticipated in his very first definition of, of symmetric L theory. You sort of observe that by hand, uh, it, those are the correct groups that you have to write down in negative degrees in order to have long exact sequence arguments working. So it, this fits very well with what was known in, in the uh, sort of in the work from Andrew Ranitsky. Okay, so let me uh, make a Okay, so uh, here's a remark slash an exercise. Namely, uh, we can do the following uh, construction. We can look at the functor which takes a perfect complex over R and just shifts it down by one. So let me call that the loop functor. It's just the loop functor of the same. Take your complex, shift it down by one, 
And then the statement is that this extends to an equivalence of Poincaré infinity categories between BPR equipped with the Coppa greater equals to n, little m structure, and the twofold uh, loop of the Coppa greater equals to m plus one structure. And the price you have to pay is that you have to insert a, that you have to insert a sign. You have to change the involution on n by a sign. So you replace sigma by minus sigma on n. So this is a, a sort of periodicity uh, result. And really, I mean, proving such an equivalence only amounts to showing that if you pull back this quadratic, um, this quadratic functor, this Poincaré structure along this functor, then what comes out is just equivalent to this Poincaré structure. So it's a very concrete formula you just have to, you have to prove. And this is not completely obvious, but, but it's also doable. So I really recommend this to do as an exercise and to deduce that the purely quadratic L theory and the purely symmetric L theory is four periodic. Because remember, those were given by those m's where m is minus infinity or plus infinity. And I mean, there is only one way to interpret plus minus infinity plus one, minus infinity or plus infinity. Uh, so this is, this is what, what will come out. And in, in fact, uh, using, using this construction, what you will find is that the minus second homotopy group of this genuine symmetric uh, L theory that we've in, in, in this case discussed the, the homotopy groups in degrees uh, less or equals minus three it can just be described by group minus even forms. Okay, I mean, whatever those are. Forms that are, I think they are standardly called symplectic forms. So forms that satisfy B of x comma x equals to zero for all elements x classical symplectic forms. So there is this periodicity result which tells us that the, on the left hand side really there are only four groups to calculate, both in the purely quadratic and in the purely symmetric variant. Whereas this, this is not the case for these genuine symmetric or genuine quadratic things, right? We've already seen for instance that the zero homotopy group of this is a, is a symmetric width group and but then then the minus second it follows from here is a symplectic uh, width group, and then the more negative things are all of a sudden quadratic width groups. But then it, it, it starts becoming periodic. Okay, so to the negative things are all periodic, and to the positive numbers we don't quite know. Um, but this is a, again, this is not a complicated statement, but it's an extremely useful statement which makes many, many arguments uh, quite handy. So I, I recommend to to try to, uh, to prove this, uh, this exercise. So, of course, this raises the question, what can we say about, oops, what can we say about higher uh, L groups? And uh, this is the question I want to address next. So I want to really start out with saying, what can we say about this, uh, uh, Markus, sorry, um, there was a question in the chat about why is the second, I mean, there might be, have been a typo in your second statement. Why is it not a special case of the first? That's what Christoph asks in, in your corollary. I'm sorry. Um, why is this not a special case of this? Ah, sorry. I mean, I think... Bastian suggested that one of the Qs is supposed to be an S. Yeah, maybe the... In, in one of these two? Yeah, maybe I'm overlooking something, but it looks to me like both are stating something about the comparison map from the quadratic to the genuine quadratic yeah, do structure. And the, the bounds for the second statement are worse than the bounds for the first one. But I, this is a Q and this genuine is a quadratic and genuine symmetric, right? So on the left, I think the, the, the Q should be an S in the second statement, right? Oh. No, no, no. It no, should no, no. Be it's actually, I think it's true as stated. Yeah. Ah, okay. On the right hand side, there's a genuine symmetric structure. Yeah, that, that's that's what I misread. Thank you. No, no. Okay. So it should always be Qs because remember, it was a corollary of something that I claimed to have proven before, and the only thing I proved before was that a map from the quadratic version to some other guy satisfies a certain uh, property, being an isomorphism in a given range, provided my functor is m quadratic for some n. And now you have to work out what, how m quadratic is the genuine quadratic one and how m quadratic is the genuine symmetric one. So I claim is the first is two quadratic, the second is zero quadratic and what comes out are these numbers. 
yeah. both compared to the actual quadratic one on the left hand side. Yeah. That's just the way it is. The, the higher homotopy groups uh, are the things that we just want to discuss next. So the statement is whenever you have an m quadratic functor, then relative to m, in low degrees, uh, the homotopy groups are just the ones of the quadratic L theory, no matter what your copper was. And next, we want to understand for particular coppers, what can we say about the higher L groups? And okay, so um, it, it will be very convenient for, for what we're going to do to give a slightly technical definition of L groups where we insert connectivity estimates on uh, objects and Lagrangians. So for now, ignore this exercise and just focus on this definition where we have R and M as always. And okay, there, is, there are numbers around that satisfy some assumption. I just wanted to write them down so something is correct, but uh, we don't have to care about them for the moment too much. And we fix the M-compatible Poincaré structure. And now what we want to do is we define an L group, an nth L group with uh, decoration A and B, where we look at equivalence classes of Poincaré objects X and Q, such that X can be represented by a complex which has length A. So if you write it as a, as a complex of finitely generated projectives, then there should only be uh, non-zero complexes in a in a length uh, interval of, of length A, and then the duality tells you exactly where it has to be. So the statement is that it's so degrees n over a minus n plus a half. I know it's just we want to say that objects are represented by complexes of length a. So in particular, if a equals to zero, those are just uh, the L groups where we demand that objects sit in a single degree. Right? That's the kind of thing that we should we should keep in mind. And then having just a general A is, is more or less a technical tool that will allow us to, to understand in, in which case we can push, push complexes to be um, constrained in a very small range. And the relation, so that's where the second uh, number comes from, is to say that uh, we want to allow only those Lagrangians, so we divide all by those forms which admit a Lagrangian, which itself satisfies uh, a certain assumption, namely that uh, the Lagrangian is concentrated in a certain range of degrees. In this case, parameterized by B. Okay, and I mean, okay, the concrete numbers are not relevant. I'm just saying that the AB L group consists of n-dimensional Poincaré objects uh, such that um, uh, X has length A and Lagrangians are only allowed to have length at most B. Okay, that's, that's the idea of, of what we're doing. And it's a good exercise to, to convince you using the things that we, we, we discussed last, uh, last lecture, that we can define uh, this L group purely in terms of connectivity estimates again. This will be relevant later. So it's just an exercise to see that you can equivalently say that X is, satisfies a certain connectivity and L and the fiber of the map from L to X satisfies a certain connectivity. Okay. I mean, this will just be convenient to know, but you should really think about these groups as, as uh, giving a control on the length of the complexes that, that you are allowed to use um, to form uh, objects and, and relations. Okay, so um, let me see. So in this case, if we have this uh, definition at hand, then step one and three of the last theorem that we said uh, can be phrased that for suitable A, B, N, and M, the map uh, from an AB controlled L group for copper to forgetting this control of A and B is an uh, isomorphism of subjective. This was the statement that we said for suitable copper, every object can be realized by, or can be, yeah, it can be made uh, so and so connected. And then in step three, we said, well, Lagrangians can be made so and so connected. Okay? So, so you can reinterpret step one and three of this, of the proof of that last term by saying that a certain forget control map is an isomorphism in a, in a suitable range. And then step two is the statement that for, uh, um, sorry, so step two of this uh, last proof was the statement that if you fix the control over lengths of complexes and Lagrangians, then changing the Poincaré structure will induce an isomorphism on everything. Okay. So this is really usually this, this two ways we, we, we walk. We want to say in general, we want to compare L groups. We first introduce 
connectivity estimates and show that we can make things equally connective. And then we show well called such objects, the comparison map from uh, one co concrete structure to another one is, is good enough to ensure that uh, this map on these controlled L groups is an ISO. And then well, we make a three out of four argument or something. Okay, so that's one way of reinterpreting the, the proof of this last term. And uh, this is just going to be the one that uh, generalizes uh, sort of correctly to, to I mean, the things that we want to have later. So, so the next thing we want to prove with that is uh, actually a quite, not a complicated theorem at all. So we want to describe what are the higher L groups uh, for this genuine symmetric functor, right? It's, I mean, these are supposed to be L groups of genuine symmetric, of like actual symmetric forms. We analyze what they are in, in non-negative, non-positive degrees. So let's try to understand what they do in positive degrees. And the statement is that these nth L group of uh, the derived category with the genuine symmetric Poincaré structure are something that I want to call short n uh, L n groups. And I mean, a, a definition of that is just the group L n with upper n and upper n plus one. Uh, of the derived category with respect to the symmetric structure, the homotopy theoretic symmetric structure. So there's an N missing here. Let me put that in. Oops, sorry. Uh, right. So in other words, um, objects are objects or points in, in this area are at most of length N. Right, n-dimensional objects which have length at most n. A Lagrangian is allowed to have at most length n plus one, and the uh, and it's just on a complex of length n. The form structure is really just a homotopy theoretic symmetric form structure. So we just take homotopy C two fixed points on that space, and that will calculate the space of forms for us. Okay. So that's the that's a statement, and I call it short L theory because that's sort of what the very first definition Andrew wrote down and also what Mishenko actually wrote down when they first constructed symmetric L theory, they, they wrote down precisely this, this condition. The L groups were by definition this. You look at complexes which are concentrated in a, in a range of degrees from minus n to zero and then just actual homotopy theoretic symmetric structures on that and you divide out only those uh, um, complexes which admit a Lagrangian which is potentially of one dimension bigger. One idea or one, one reason why this is a reasonable thing to do is if you always think that a, 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 an oriented manifold should give rise to such, a, to such an object in these, in these uh, derived categories by passing to code chains. And the code chains of an n-dimensional manifold are just a complex which are you know, strictly concentrated in, in degrees minus n up to zero. And if you have a cobordism between two where that cobordism is an n plus one dimensional manifold, it, its code chains will be concentrated in degrees minus n minus one up to zero. So that is, I think, the, the idea that the, the geometric relevant objects, they, they give rise to, to such uh, classes in the L theory. And this is why they, they defined it in, like this in the first place. OK, and the proof is actually quite easy because it, I mean, right, I mean, we, we don't have so many things at our disposal. What can we do? We have to show that elements of LN DPR with copper genuine S can be represented by minus N connective complexes. This is just what it means that, you know, you can lift up to LN N, right? You want to make a complex N connective. And, uh, and that is just, that immediately follows, or uh, something that I put down here, it follows immediately from the fact that uh, this genuine symmetric functor is zero quadratic. Uh, in other words, that uh, the, if you write down what is the linear term in this decomposition, uh, it was the statement that uh, the module is itself connected, or in other words, that COPPA itself evaluates on projective modules to something which is connected. And by definition, this, this functor evaluates on a projective module to a discrete spectrum, just the spectrum uh, to the spectrum which has the abelian group of symmetric forms in degree zero and nothing else. In particular, that's connected. And that connectivity suffices to show that you can perform surgery as to make every complex uh, be given in, in a range minus n up to zero. So I would like to call that sort of you can do surgery below the dimension. Yeah. Typically in, in geometric surgery, one always knows yeah, you can always do surgery below the middle dimension. 
but that's kind of a different different story. In, in this situation, we can sort of do surgery below the dimension. Then the second statement would be that on such n-dimensional complexes, the the space of forms or the you know the equivalence classes of forms given parameterized by this genuine symmetric structure compared to the space of forms given by the actual symmetric structures, that is a pi zero isomorphism. Okay. So, so just the notion of forms happens to agree, provided our complexes are already uh, concentrated in, in this range of degrees. So that's something that follows from the fact that uh, this uh, genuine symmetric functor is too symmetric. And I mean, the, the two is not so important, but I want you to remember that being R symmetric for some R was precisely a statement about this comparison map having a certain co connectivity being an isomorphism in a certain range. I mean, yeah, that, that was the definition. So it, it's not surprising that uh, that one will have such a, such a result. The only thing you actually have to check is some exercise that I, I gave you, you know, being too symmetric was by definition something you could check for uh, applying somehow only uh, x equals to r, and now you need to know how you can maneuver uh, if you if you insert more more general such complexes, and then the connectivity bound will exactly tell you that this map is a pi zero isomorphism. And then likewise, in in the third step, you have to show that if you have an n-dimensional connective Poincaré object uh, which admits a Lagrangian, any good old Lagrangian, then it emits one which is minus n minus one connective, because that's the definition here, right? I mean, Essentially, this, I mean, if, if you just write out the definitions, this is what you have to do. And again, you just perform surgery on the Lagrangians. And again, the, this is sort of below the dimension for a Lagrangian. And then you can do this. This is really more or less uh, follows immediately from, from the, the things we've done before. Okay. So, what I want to. Um, do now is to say, well, okay, now we've understood that A, these genuine symmetric higher L groups have, have also a, an easy description. They're really given by complexes, which are not uh, in a single degree, but are concentrated in a range of degrees given by the, de I mean, bounded by the degree in which we are. So in LN, uh, it's given by complexes which uh, sit in, in degrees minus N up to zero. And now we can ask ourselves, I mean, how will you ever calculate such an L group? I mean, imagine you have to calculate an L group of complexes, which are, I don't know, concentrated in a range of degrees up to say 17 or something. And there are millions of such complexes around. There are probably millions of quadrat or of, of Poincaré structures on that. I mean, how, how are you ever going to control something? And so uh, what, what will come out is that uh, the, the thing that we, we want to achieve is that we want to now compare a good old L group for any given Poincaré structure to the symmetric Poincaré structure for the following reason. This L theory we know is four periodic, right? So there are really only four groups that, that can appear. And that means that if, if we can show that such a map is an isomorphism in high degrees, and we happen to be able to calculate these symmetric groups, then we can calculate many, many groups here because in a high range they, they do agree. And the, the, this will not be true in general, sort of, I think that we will have to have some assumptions. This, I mean, it's not going to be true that this map is always an isomorphism for any copper, uh, but in fact, um, we need to have another assumption on the, on the ring itself. So the theorem that I want to indicate is that if we have a Noetherian ring of finite global dimension D, so that just means that every module has a projective resolution of length less or equals to D, and copper is an M-compatible and R-symmetric Poincaré structure. In this situation, the comparison map from the L group associated to copper mapping to the L group associated to the symmetric structure underlying this by module M is an isomorphism of a type, right? So in a range N greater or equals to some perturbation of the dimension which has to do with yeah, some, some bound which has to do with the dimension and the question how symmetric is your, is your Poincaré structure. And instead of uh, proving this particular result, I want to tell you about a generalization, which will be very useful for us uh, at, in the final lecture, and then prove a special case of that, 
but the special case contains all all arguments that that actually go into the general um, uh, statement but the bookkeeping of numbers will be just easier so uh, and the idea is to do uh, the following uh, generalization namely to say we take a step back and say we want to consider a stable infinity categories equipped with a t structure uh, and i mean i'll come to come to this in a moment so so the setup for now should be that if we have a small and stable infinity category equipped with a t structure c greater equals to zero and c lesser equals to zero and the main example to keep in mind is just take the perfect complexes of a, of a ring which is an ethereum of finite global dimension and then the t structure is just the restriction of the usual Posnikov t structure on the full derived category right so so if you take any good old ring then the full derived category has a t structure by saying the you know connective things are the connective chain complexes and the co-connective things are the co-connective chain complexes the ones that only have homology in non-positive degree are co-connected the ones that only have homology in non-negative degree are the connected ones now in general such t structures will not uh, restrict to perfect complexes because for instance you would have to show that if you have a connected complex then it's zero homotopy group which is given by the zero truncation would also have to be perfect uh, but i mean this is exactly given imagine if you have like a single like a, a finitely generated module sitting in a single degree then this being a perfect complex exactly means that you have a finite length resolution of finitely generated projectors, right? This is exactly what it means to be a perfect complex if you have a, a finitely generated module sitting in a single degree. And uh, so, so these um, under the assumption that R has a finite global dimension, the the Posnikov T structure on the derived category just restricts the perfect objects. And this is the kind of example that we will always more or less encounter. And the general setup is then that we say, well, we're we assume we're given a duality on this category and again i mean in the example that we care about we had our good uh, by module m around that determined the duality this is just the generalization of that and then we consider a symmetric Poincaré structure on c which is given by well send x to the mapping spectrum from x to dx and that to the hc2 and because d is a duality and that, that sort of means a homotopy coherent Six point for d squared is canonically identified with uh, the identity, then this is a perfectly valid uh, Poincare structure, which in the case where C is the perfect derived category and the duality comes from such a bimodule just reproduces what we used to call copper SM. Okay? So this is the direct generalization of, of the example we always have. And now we say that a Poincare structure copper on such a C is D compatible well if the duality associated to copper is just the duality we already had just as before and we call it r symmetric if for all connective objects x so the ones that are in the c greater equals to zero the fiber of the map from x the copper of x to copper s of x is minus r truncated just as we had i mean just as we defined it before before i mean there was some exercise saying that this was exactly how we could characterize our symmetric functors for uh, the perfect derived categories. So it, this is a good exercise to convince yourself that we have not redefined what it means to be minus R or R symmetric if C was of the kind DPR associated to a ring of finite global dimension. Okay? This, is, this is just literally the same, same definition that we have. Okay, so this is the, the setup that we want to use. And uh, yeah, it will become apparent either at the end of this lecture or I mean, most likely in the next lecture why this is why this is a useful um, setup. And okay, so using some exercise that I forgot to figure out uh, which which one it is, but some exercise before uh, we can define these uh, L and A B C copper groups by interpreting where I said. Yeah, was define these LAB groups in terms of only connectivity estimates on X and Lagrangians and the fiber of the map between the Lagrangian and X. Right? But being connective is something that we can perfectly well uh, interpret in a stable infinity category with a T structure by saying we call it connective or K connective if it's contained in C greater equals to K, which is, of course, maybe I should also write this down. Uh, this is, of course, just the K fold shift of C greater equals to zero. So all objects 
uh, that I obtain by taking a connective object in C greater or equals to zero and shifting it up k times. Okay, so it makes perfect. I mean, yeah, we can just we have a direct a definition of such an L and A B group with control over sort of lengths of uh, of complexes because we can reinterpret this length condition in terms of the connectivity estimates, which make perfect sense in this context. And okay, as I said in words earlier, we will now formulate a general theorem and then prove only a special case uh, of that the theorem that, that I alluded to up here, a statement about the, the L theory of the ring with finite global dimension. And, but I mean, the, the, the general argument is not much more complicated. And the theorem is as follows. So we fix a stable infinity category with a T structure. Uh, with the duality D, define this proper symmetric as before. And now imagine that we are given a Poincare structure which is R symmetric and D compatible. Just the, the, the usual kind of setup that we want. And now we need to make one assumption, namely, we need to know that the duality of C, uh, sorry, that the duality takes the co connective objects, not necessarily connective objects, but at least to minus D connective objects for some for some number d. So again, this is mimicked by the fact that if you have a ring of finite global dimension d, then the standard duality on this module category satisfies precisely this assumption. Right? And again, this comes from the fact, I mean, imagine you have like a, a, a finite, I mean, a connective, like the one connective uh, chain complex you can have is just a finitely generated module sitting in degree zero. That's a perfect complex over R, certainly. And um, now if we apply the duality to that, it can happen that it becomes minus D uh, connected because we have to resolve by projectives and then you know, things, things slip down to negative degrees, but it cannot get worse because you can resolve everything by projective module, uh, by chain complexes of length less or equals to D or finitely generated projectives. So that's essentially the idea uh, that um, tells us that for rings of finite dimension D, the standard duality will satisfy this assumption. And in general, we can just ask that this is the case for some d greater equals to zero. And then again, there are some numbers flying around which have to have some estimates that are not super important for now, but I wanted to just have a correct statement. And under these assumptions, the statement is that if the, that the forget control map from the nth L group of C copper with control AB, forgetting the control is an isomorphism. Okay? As a general feature. So. And um, the exercise I want you <laughs> to do is to prove the theorem uh, that I've written down here. Prove this theorem from, uh, from this theorem. So assume you, you know this statement about uh, stable infinity categories with a T structure, then try to prove this very first theorem by considering such a, such a commutative square where you wish to apply the general theorem to these two horizontal maps. And then you will want to show that using the R symmetry condition on copper that with fixed um, control on uh, connectivity of objects and Lagrangians, once you've fixed that, uh, these uh, estimates, then the comparison map becomes an isomorphism. Okay? And again, the argument is going to be very similar as before. You will have to show that you can lift forms for complexes that satisfy a certain estimate and that you can lift null homotopies for Lagrangians which satisfy. Okay. So it's it's very it's very much like uh, the the steps that I've uh, indicated in the in the very beginning of this lecture. Okay. And and so the the statement that instead I want to prove today is the following simple version, which is already very good for what we want to know, namely if we have a Noetherian ring of finite global dimension D, then the map from Ln n plus 1 n dpr copper s n to dpr copper s n is an isomorphic control map where I've exactly added the control n and n plus 1. And notice that from before we already know that this group by sort of a different type of surgery argument was exactly given by the nth L group of the genuine symmetric structure. That's, that's the thing we've, we've proved earlier. So the genuine symmetric L theory was just symmetric, was the L theory of symmetric uh, forms on complexes with a certain connectivity bound. 
And now we want to show that forgetting this connectivity bound is an isomorphism provided R has a certain uh, bound on the global dimension. So the statement precisely is that this map is an isomorphism once n is at least the dimension minus one. In particular, for one dimensional rings, this is an isomorphism for all when n greater or equals to zero. So that's the thing that we will we'll utilize uh, tomorrow. So tomorrow we'll calculate L groups, these general symmetric L groups for certain types of one dimensional rings, Dedekind rings, and, and you utilize heavily that you, you can have this estimate. So for all potential experts in the audience, I want to say that such a result, a similar such result was known to Andrew Ranitsky, but uh, for some reason that is really not easy to figure out exactly where it came from. He had this assumption uh, with the factor, uh, the same conclusion with the factor two. So he was able to prove this such a result for n greater equals two times d minus one. And of course, in the very interesting case where d equal to one, you know, zero is two times zero. So for, for one dimensional rings, he has exactly the same result as we do. But in, in general, one can just make this, um, this bound better than expected. And I think this is really an advertisement for, for sort of this abstract setup. You will see in a moment when I, I prove this special case that it's extremely complicated to really get confused with what you're supposed to do. Whereas Andrew was explicitly writing down chain complexes and doing them together and then had to calculate explicit maps. And he, yeah, apparently somehow in, in this translation, um, it, it, it was possible for him to, to not get the optimal uh, bound on, on such an isomorphism. But, but in our case, you will see in a moment, this is actually, uh, you do a very canonical thing and it just works out. So let me indicate how you prove that very last term that forgetting the control beyond the dimension minus one uh, is, an, is an isomorphism of L groups. Okay, so let's try to prove surjectivity of the map in question. So remember that means we take an element in the L group of the actual symmetric structure. And what we need to show is that we can represent it by a complex which uh, sits only in degrees minus, or I mean, which has a certain connectivity estimate. And the precise connectivity estimate is uh, that we wish to make x minus n connected. This is, this is the thing that we need to achieve in order to, to prove this result. And okay, so let's recall just for a moment that this bounded derived, uh, this perfect derived category has a T structure. Uh, which satisfies this assumption as I, as I indicated last time, coming from the fact that you can projectively resolve with a fixed length bound any finite degenerate module. And let tau less or equals to k be the canonical truncation functors that come with this T structure. Right? The T structure comes with functors that allow you to uh, take any object and make it I mean, k truncated, is tau less or equals to k. And what we want to find is that we can make x minus n connected. So that's unraveling the definitions. This is what we have to achieve to prove surjectivity of the map. And what we do is when we say, hmm, what is the failure for x to be n connective? Well, it's this term. It's the truncation of minus n minus one of x, right? If, if, if this term were zero, then x would be uh, n minus n connective, right? Because the, the fiber of this map is exactly the minus n connective cover of x. So we can just take this map and then we would somehow like to perform surgery on it. We would like to get rid of this term. And what you do is you just apply omega n decopper to this, to this map. And what you obtain is a map from an object I would like to call w, which is given by omega n decopper of this truncation of x. And now it maps to omega n decopper x just by you know, dualizing this particular map. But this object comes with a canonical equivalence to x because x was a Poincaré object of dimension n, right? So this is part of the statement that x is a Poincaré object of dimension n, then you obtain such an equivalence. Sizes that are worthwhile doing. The first one is to see that w is in fact minus d plus one connected in this sense that it lies in c greater or equals to minus d plus one. That's just playing around with this assumption and I don't know like what the duality does and what the truncation does and what these and these spell out. And then the uh, second point is that 
Now, suppose you can perform surgery on this map, right? So in other words, that the form Q that we have here, the form Q, I mean, maybe I should say just the form Q, if you restrict it along this map, then it gives rise to a form on W, and if this form is zero, then we're allowed to perform surgery. So suppose we are allowed to perform surgery, then the claim is that the surgery trace is canonically identified with the minus n connective cover of x. And from this assumption and this exercise, you will be able to show that the surgery output, in fact, is minus n connective. Okay. So in other words, again, we just we, we take the obvious candidate, which is the, the error term for you know, our object to have the connectivity estimate we want. And then we just ask, well, I mean, if we can perform surgery, then we're good. We just do it and we're done. And now the only thing is that we have to find out whether or not uh, this form restricts to zero so that we can perform the surgery that we want. And for this, you just calculate that uh, the loops n of this uh, symmetric structure on D associated to W, now this is minus one truncated. And in particular, it does not have pi zero, right? All homotopy groups sit in negative degrees. It doesn't have pi zero, so you can perform surgery. So this is really just a very dual ar argument to what we've seen earlier. Earlier, we, we would have said, well, our copper has some certain quadraticity assumption. And then it always allowed us to deduce that uh, the candidate for a surgery problem was, in fact, a surgery datum because a certain space of forms on that candidate was highly connected. And then we, we cared about, about the pi zero. Now the situation is just different. This, this space, which, you know, explained to us whether or not we can perform the surgery doesn't have a pi zero because it's in fact co-connected. It sits in negative, the homotopy group sits in negative. And that is controlled exactly by the condition that sort of this uh, copper structure is R symmetric for a correct part. Okay, this is, this is essentially where it comes from. And so, well, in this case, we find we can perform the surgery and then by this uh, argument we're done and subjectivity is shown. And of course, I mean, again, this statement is always the same, of course, that uh, for uh, uh, for uh, injectivity, the argument is similar. So you wish to perform surgery on Lagrangians. And I, mean, I just want to write, you know, so that you can look it up in the notes. Uh, if you have an, uh, a concrete object XQ, which is in the kernel of this uh, map in question, i.e. where x itself is already minus n connective and there exists some Lagrangian L to x, then you will construct uh, the fiber of the map from L to x. It will turn out that uh, yeah, by definition of a Lagrangian, uh, L is equivalent to some loop of the dual of n. And you define n prime in a similar manner as before. You construct this canonical map to n. And then you find out that, well, a map from n prime to n is really the same thing as a map from n to L, uh, sorry, from n prime to L, whose composition with x is canonically null homotopic, I mean, null homotopic. It's, it comes with a null homotopy, right? This is exactly the datum which uh, corresponds to having a lift to the fiber. And so we've constructed the map to the fiber. So we, in particular, have a map to L, and the composite to X is canonically null homotopy. And then we do the same thing we've done already earlier. We view this as a surgery datum in a metabolic category. So view this as an object in the metabolic category, this as an object in the metabolic category, and this square as a morphism in that category. And then we want to perform surgery on that. Well, and then you do the same argument again. You just have to calculate that the the space which tells us whether or not we can perform surgery, in fact, doesn't have a pi zero because it's again minus one chunk. Okay, so it, it's the very same argument for Lagrangians viewed as concrete objects in the metabolic category. And it's essentially the same assumptions that allow to deduce the, uh, this theorem then. And, and really, the, the general theorem for stable infinity categories with a T structure and general A and B satisfying these assumptions that I wrote down, I mean, are just. It's, it's the same thing, you just have to be more. I mean, I don't have M's and have to be a bit more careful with that these estimates all work out. But all, all uh, constructions and ideas are present here. If you just copy the button, what, what I wrote down, and, uh, you will have a proof of the general, general theorem. Okay, so upshot is that 
the symmetric uh, L theory and the general symmetric L theory for rings of finite uh, global dimension do agree in a high range compared to the global dimension. So let me. Uh, right, so before coming, coming to that, let me make some corollaries of the general statement about um, uh, stable categories with uh, a T structure. And the results are maybe slightly technical, but, but still um, not so bad. So we want to suppose that uh, we have an Ethereum ring of global dimension zero. Such rings are also called semi-simple. You know what a semi-simple ring is, then you're good. And if, I mean, in any case, these rings are uh, semi-simple rings. And then the statement is uh, the following three uh, uh, points. Uh, the statement is that an even L group of this uh, genuine symmetric structure is in fact the zeroth projective uh, the, the width group of projective modules uh, with, so to say, uh, forms determined by this uh, functor copper GS. And this is true for every k greater or equals to minus 2. Um, so in other words, if we have a ring of global dimension 0, we've already seen that the general symmetric uh, L theory is the same as the symmetric L theory in high degrees. And in fact, in this dimension zero case, we can push this down to degrees minus uh, k minus two. And in each case, it's just given by an ordinary width group of projective modules. Um, and okay, so then there is, I don't know, some, some other variants that I just wanted to put on the board. Uh, one uh, um, thing that is also very useful or will be very useful in tomorrow's lecture is that Suppose we have an n-valued symmetric form, or for that matter, it could also be quadratic or even in the very classical sense on a finitely generated projective module, such that its image in the width group, as I've defined the width group, vanishes. So by definition, this means that there is, an, there is a module, uh, a symmetric form, which has a Lagrangian, so a metabolic form, such that the sum of P and Q and that metabolic form is itself metabolic. That is, that is what, what it means to be zero in this, in this width group. And the statement is that, well, in this case of zero dimensional rings, in fact, you can already deduce that this stability problem does not occur. If you have an, an object which is zero in the width group, in fact, it already admits an, an actual Lagrangian. So we call that strictly metabolic. It's not only metabolic up to adding metabolics. It's just actually uh, itself metabolic. And Note also that you know examples of semi-simple rings that will <laughs> will come up in tomorrow's lecture are fields. Fields are of course perfectly fine semi-simple rings, and uh, it's probably not very complicated to show that uh, this conclusion holds for fields. But just want to advertise that formally comes out of this um, out of this machine and roughly indicate how it comes out of it. So that goes as follows. Oops. So the, the way we prove this is that we apply this general theorem and we apply it to uh, the control zero and zero. So what does that mean for, uh, I mean, yeah. So having control zero, zero means essentially that objects are represented by chain complexes which have length zero, i.e. are just finitely generated projective concentrated in a single degree. But now Lagrangians are also uh, have the same bound, right? We have the, another zero saying that the Lagrangians exact, are in fact also of length zero. And that will force the Lagrangian to be a, a classical Lagrangian. It's actually a submodule, finitely generated project, submodule sitting in, in that particular degree. Okay? So this statement just exactly says uh, three, and it also implies one, I think. But, it, but in any case, so. And then the fun thing is that if you work through all these numbers that I wrote down, these technical terms, we were allowed to, we were allowed to also insert minus one in the very first term, which means that, you know, objects should be represented by complexes which have length minus one. That doesn't mean you interpret that as just to say this is zero automatically because there are no such forms. And in other words, if once we can apply uh, such a result and know that this is an isomorphism, it will just tell that this group is zero. Okay, so this is, yeah, this is essentially where, I'm sorry, this is where condition one then comes in. 
you want to show that certain odd dimensional uh, groups vanish. And um, as, an, uh, as a consequence or as an exercise, we find uh, that the odd dimensional L groups associated to, to the quadratic and to the symmetric structure, not the genuine ones, the actual quadratic and actual symmetric structures, these vanish for semi-simple rings. Okay, that's a, that's a nice consequence of, of everything we've done so far. Let me just uh, try to work that out. And um, as a corollary also, another corollary um, associated to, to this main theorem is that if you have an Ethereum ring of finite global dimension D, then the comparison map from the genuine quadratic uh, functor and its L theory to the genuine symmetric one is an isomorphism in a range of degrees greater or equals to D plus three. And I mean, why is that? Well, because we can compare both with, you know, L, N, D, P, R, and then copper S, M. And then it turns out that the genuine symmetric functor is, uh, I don't, I'm not get confused, it's I think two symmetric. The genuine quadratic functor is still zero symmetric. It, it, it's a bit less symmetric, but it's still the theorem applies. And so uh, we know something here, we know something here, and then by three, four, two, we know something here. Okay, and let me, let me advertise, I think this also appeared in Jonathan's talk, but let me say it again. By means of this fiber sequence that relates Hermitian K theory and L theory and algebraic K theory, and the fact that algebraic K theory does not at all see the difference between these two Poincaré structures, that, I mean, through the eyes of algebraic K theory, these are just the same things because the underlying duality, sort of the, the module N we associate with, is the same. This really means that on the level of Hermitian K theory, the Grothendieck Liquid -Grot groups will also coincide in high degrees compared to the dimension. And it's also known that these, uh, that these spaces have something to do with you know, the automorphisms of, of, of such uh, arithmetic uh, groups that are the automorphism groups of particular uh, forms, particular quadratic forms or symmetric forms. And it's quite surprising actually that, that, in, that after group completion, these, this inclusion will be an isomorphism in a high range depending only on the dimension of P. So, I, I don't think we have a good philosophical explanation for why this should be the case, but it, it sort of comes out of the theory that once you once you've passed the threshold of the dimension, the difference between these two different kinds of actual sort of genuine forms on on actual projective modules will disappear through the eyes of Hermitian K theory. And uh, yes, one exercise that is uh, really fun to work out is that if you have a commutative no theory ring of global dimension D, as, uh, as we always have in this case, and assume for funsies that R is two torsion free. So for instance, I mean, I don't know, like easy examples would be number rings or something, right? Rings of integers and number fields. These are two torsion free rings. Then look at the uh, module M equals to R itself and sigma the identity. And then it turns out that you can actually make this estimate a bit better. In fact, that the comparison map between the genuine quadratic and genuine symmetric one is an isomorphism for n greater or equal to d plus one and not d plus three. And uh, yeah, so the, the hinges try to, to use this periodicity result that we've seen last time, uh, I've, I've alluded to in the beginning of this lecture, there was a periodicity result and try to use that to, to, to relate the, uh, the L theory of the genuine quadratic functor associated to R and to that of minus R. And then try to apply the theorem for the one with minus R and then hope to get something out for, for the version with R and, and likewise for the symmetric case. So we can really utilize that this is, um, yeah, that we have this flexibility of changing our module a little bit, uh, but in, we can apply the general theorem to many such modules. And then if we can apply certain periodicity arguments, we can improve the, the range where that's isomorphisms. So that's a, that's a, that's a fun exercise to, to work out. And so let me, let me highlight uh, and say what the goal for tomorrow's lecture is. The goal will be to compute the genuine symmetric L groups for a dedicant ring with fraction field. The end of tomorrow, I, I want to have at least at the end of the lecture, we want to have a full calculation of all L groups of the integers. At least. Why not? Right? From, from the way we've, we've described this. And in fact, you can, you can give general formulas uh, that we then just want to specialize down to the integers. Uh, 
And so, so far, what we know is the following. Um, so what I wrote down here is, in fact, true for any Dedekind ring, so a one-dimensional ring whose, uh, whose fraction field, say, does not have characteristic two. That's an assumption we use. And then the statement is that the nth L group with respect to this genuine symmetric structure, just the social, I mean, with R, say, you know, it's a commutative ring, nothing fancy, will be given by quadratic L groups in dimensions less or equal minus three, of course, not three. Less or equals minus three. And it will be symmetric L groups in, uh, in all dimensions greater or equals minus two. Okay, so there, in fact, all these genuine symmetric uh, L groups are just actually quadratic or actually symmetric L groups and, and, and therefore it suffices to calculate these kinds of groups. And what we will see tomorrow is two different mechanisms that will allow us to prove this group, respectively this group, by sort of means, I don't know, like a Maya Vitoris type uh, sequences. So, so what we will see in this case is that we will try to relate the L theory in the symmetric case of a Dedekind ring to its quotient, the L theory of its quotient field, and by a Devisar's argument to the L theory of all its residue fields at fixed primes. And then both other, I mean, both these terms are fields, and for fields, we essentially know what happens because there are zero dimensional rings, and I just had a corollary that explained, you know, all dimensional groups are zero, the even dimensional ones are just with groups of symmetric or anti symmetric forms, and everything is periodic, so like fully determined. And on the quadratic side, uh, Devisage unfortunately does not hold. So there is no such argument we can do. And then there is a, a sort of a, a different kind of uh, construction you can do, which uh, uh, has to do with uh, passing to sort of from the global field, like the number field case to a local field. And in that case, use uh, an invariance under sort of complete ideals uh, construction of quadratic L theory. So, so there will be two different features that appear, uh, and both of which are good enough to essentially calculate what we want. And that's what I'm going to focus on tomorrow. And for today, I will leave it at that. Thanks. Well, thank you, Markus. Um, as, as the other days, are there any direct questions that we should talk about now? Um, that is not the case. I say we uh, again grab a coffee and then uh, have a question session. And we need to thank.